I'm just going to draw from this diagram, just so you understand this two-point perspective. And I'm just saying earlier to the early arrivals that I sent out a video of uh, the, sorry, I'm just pinning these up. Pin, 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 pin. Um, of the one-point perspective in a room that we did last week. So I hope that was helpful. Um, and you can find pretty much everything on the internet. There's a, a boy who's about 12 who does quite good art classes, but it's, you know, just the basic skills. So what I'm going to do first is draw my horizon line. And I'm going to do that in red. Walk off a bit. Okay. And then I'm going to have two vanishing points here and here. Lucy, can I ask you something? Mm -hmm. From where I am, that looks as though it's slightly ab below, above, the line is above halfway down the page. Is that right? Uh, yes, it is. So this, um, this drawing is uh, someone standing on a ladder, basically. You can see that horizon line, which is also your eye level, is yeah. quite high in relation to the buildings. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, so it's quite high. <clears throat> and then I'm going to take a line, I don't know, what's that? That's not 45 degrees, less than 45 degrees there. And then a line about 45 degrees down here. Temporarily. And then again, a similar line here. Similar angle, and again, down here. Let's hope they marry up. I'm hoping they're going to marry up. Right. Okay, so that's indicating your sort of lines to your vanishing point. And as I say, the vanishing point is always on the horizon which they missed out in this diagram, and is generally your eye level. <clears throat> okay, so now we'll start thinking about constructing buildings. Okay, so this is your uh, the corner of the building that you're trying to draw. And uh, the horizontals are generally, sorry, the verticals are generally constant. So what I'm going to do now is correct this. So that's the corner. <clears throat> of this building here. And then I'm going to use my red, I'm going to the vanishing point and the corner of the building. And the vanishing point to the corner of the building over here. Oops. Okay. And then let's put in another bit of the building. Okay, so there I have a building. Isn't that funny? I sort of pixelating. Uh, okay, oops. Okay, we have a building, a bit taller than one in the diagram, but never mind. Um, and then the reason why it's so useful to know about um, perspective and how to use it is that the lintel of the doors and the windows will correspond to the various vanishing points. So this plane corresponds to that vanishing point. This plane corresponds to this vanishing point. So I'm just gonna go in and try and put some windows in. Uh, some second story windows. Oh. Yeah, we can call that the window. And then <clears throat> I can put some windows in. If I go down here. So if we have very big windows, the, the bottom of the window will correspond to that vanishing point. So all these lines on here will correspond to that vanishing point. In fact, I might even put a door in. 
continue on with that. And then we could have a door. <clears throat> okay, let's put our very big windows in. So I'm just going to go. Let's start here. One. So that's one window. And here we have a third window. And then, so those tops and bottoms of those windows are in perspective. Okay, and then I'm going to put a door in. Oh, well, there is one on this side, but I'm going to do it anyway. So here. And there we have a door. Okay, and then over here, I will put another door in. Why not? There is one there after all. So again, so this plane corresponds to this vanishing point. And then I could have some, some smaller windows up here. Uh, stop when you're having fun. So again, corresponding to that vanishing point. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so I've got to put a door in here, a bit further away than it is in the diagram. Can you see? So it's all sort of reading right to the western eye. And then we could have some smaller windows here. So we have one here, one here, oops, one here, one here, one here, one here. One here, one here, one here. Okay, can you see how that sort of gives you space on a two-dimensional piece of paper? It's an optical illusion, but it's sort of there. And then we have a couple of other buildings that we could throw in just for fun. <clears throat> so again, anything on this side of the street will correspond to that vanishing point. Yeah. So I'm putting my vertical in. It's going to be another one in. So this is like that. And then this, <laughs> this plane will correspond to that vanishing point. And I'm not, oh dear, that's where life gets complicated. So that should go like there. So things facing this way over here, will, so this corresponds to that vanishing point, this plane here, and that plane <clears throat> corresponds to that vanishing point. With me so far? <clears throat> yeah. And I could demonstrate it a bit better on this side. So if I have a building here, make it a bit further away. So again, I'm going to put in my horizontal line. There, and I should make sure that that building does read true. Okay, so that's this side, this side of that building, but this side will correspond to that vanishing point. This is where it gets a bit complicated, so don't panic, it'll be fine. So that's there, and that's there. Okay, and if you can't stand perspective, just do everything flat plane elevation.
Okay. So that's the theory. Now we're going to put it into practice. Is everybody caught up? Let's go to gallery view and have a quick butchers. So everybody caught up? Thumbs up. Yeah. Because you have people in my class before have done this with me before. But um, <clears throat> it can be complicated and one can forget, but it's just such a useful artistic tool. And how's my picture? Is it, it seems to be breaking up. Pitting myself again in a minute. Okay, so now for our artistic project. I've been quite sneaky. I'm sort of choosing pictures that have got good vanishing points. Although this is a bit, it's not too wiggly. Often these old buildings are so wiggly, it's hard to uh, figure out what's going on. Yeah, yeah. So you've all got this, have you, that you're going to be working from? Ah. Let's try that. Okay. I want to get the edge of the building. Okay, so I'm still going to use my red crayon and I'm going to try and point out the, the double vanishing points in this building. Oh, look. So I suppose the horizon line, because I think the, the photographer was obviously a bit further down. And this is straight, honest. So if I call that my horizon line, I'm hoping this will work. Okay, so that's your kind of your horizon line. So I'm going to put the corner of the building in. Uh, I think it's quite high, so that's there. That's there. Oops, that's too much, but I'll put it in anyway. Um, that's too high. Ignore that. <laughs> And then what I'm going to do, in fact, I'm going to use my pen, 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 pen. Uh, but now I don't have room for the roof, but never mind. I'm going to take the this line here and see if I can find the vanishing point. Uh, oh dear, I'm trying to get the edge of the paper. It's going to be a bit steeper. And then here, and then that line there. And what you can also do is use sighting. So that's the angle of the roof. Hmm, pretty good, actually. And then that's the angle of that bit. Oh, I could take the tires off there. I'm going to make it a bit steeper, otherwise it won't hit the horizon line. All right. You can see it really does go to the edge of the page, so actually having a bigger piece of paper is probably better. <clears throat> so that is supposed to be that line. I think I have done it steeper than it is, but never mind. And then just to orientate yourself, it's quite a good idea to put in your other horizontal lines. Yeah, hang on there. Um, so in fact, this is not going to work out at all. A bit smaller. So I'm hoping it's all looking at the end. Okay, so now. What I want to do is just to get the sort of scale of the building. So I'm just going to go, um, sorry, I'm just going to there. you can see what's going on. I'm just going to draw the basics of the building. Oops, that's a bit too long. So it's probably a good idea to put it on rough paper. 
that was really wrong, but never mind. <laughs> um, and then, I've got to put the roof on. So that's the basics of your building. And then you want to do the roof. And unfortunately, so pitch roofs will um, um, will not conform to the perspective, but the top and the bottom of the roof will. Uh, and so here we are. I'm making a bit taller, <clears throat> but then we got something weird happening on this face. So <clears throat> I'm going to call that the top of the pitch roof. And then sort of try and draw in this bit. So it's kind of like that. Uh, sort of a Sussex barn kind of there. But again, this angle should correspond to that bit. Oh, well. uh, I'm not playing ball, really. Uh, <clears throat> Lucy? Yeah. I'm hopelessly lost. So am I. <laughs> Two of us. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is trying to get the two-point perspective of this building. Perhaps we should get the tracing paper out again. Uh, <clears throat> so you have here is this perspective. Remember, we did the big blocks. So this is kind of this perspective. And what I'm trying to do is find the vanishing point for this side, which is over here. Apart from that, my dying, this is not <laughs> coming out like it should. Uh, <clears throat> you see what I mean? So we're trying to find the vanishing point of that side. What with all these little black bits as well, and the windows and the doors and everything will actually correspond to the vanishing point on this plane. And then this plane here corresponds to this vanishing point. Okay, and this is not working out how this looks like. And unfortunately, it's got this rather complicated roof. Which, if you're really stuck, do sighting. So that's there. So that's that angle there. Plonk it on. This is this kind of barn-shaped roof, which is not going to correspond to any perspective that we can see. And then let's pretend it does that. So we want some water, some kitchen towels. Actually, I didn't put that quite so close to my computer. Um, <clears throat> kitchen towel. Every time we do a watercolor, have kitchen towel ready. And my watercolors Put here and so probably I will use uh, brushes so I've got a this is a size 12 size 12 and probably a size 6 and I think that's some others knocking around I've got a little square one which is quite so you get these little square brushes this is sea whites it's very good actually these synthetic sea whites very good um, square. So when you're painting square things, if you have a square brush, it makes life much easier. Now I thought I bought watercolor brushes. Um, hang on a minute. This area here and the one below will also correspond to this vanishing point. So this is the uh, sort of Tudor stuff. So I'm just drawing a red line. <clears throat> So I know where to put these bits of whatever they're called. It's called something. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. <clears throat> okay, I'm just going. This is a drawing to go through the theory of how to use two-point perspective of how to tackle this building. But what I realised is when I drew it up myself, <clears throat> it's quite a shallow perspective. So the vanishing point is pretty much over here. But can you see that the, these diminish? So just that little thing, if you get one of these lines wrong, it's just gonna jar and think 
people think, oh, something wrong with that building. So I'll just kind of put in the two three bits. Use a fat pen. Tutory bits. Okay. Um, okay, and then you have the bits that go downwards. Uh, I'm just using a nice big fat pen. And being handmade, they're a little bit wiggly. And then within here, you've got the windows. And so, And so windows, again, the little lintels of the windows will also correspond to that vanishing point. Ah, you could also put lots of bushes around. That was my plan. <clears throat> oh dear, now we've got to do the other side. Right, uh, well, also there's the chimneys. <laughs> I'm not freak anybody out now. Um, so if I put, um, I haven't left enough room, but so we've got some chimneys in there. And there's a big old chimney over here. So the tops of those chimneys ah, will correspond to this vanishing point. Well, this side of the chimneys. There. A bit weird. And then here. And then they've got the other side and they will correspond to this one and they will disappear. Paper, so the chimney is a kind of square things. So this side, this side of the chimney, oops, the top will go to that vanishing point. This side of the chimney, because it's the same as that side, will go to that vanishing point. So I'm persecuting the chimneys. And the same applies here. So that side goes there. And that side will go there, probably. And again. Okay, so you can kind of try to try to draw cubes in space, and you can do that uh, like we were doing last week. I did have the floating cube trick, uh, <clears throat> which I think I showed you last week as well. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so then we've got all these fiddly bits, and I drew it up this morning. I thought, oh god, why did I choose something so complicated? But this is black and white. Uh, so what I'm going to do is go for the middle lintel here, where the doors kind of end up, because that's kind of a structural one, and that is a little bit higher than the tiles. But so all everything on this plane, this plane will correspond to this vanishing point. I'm just going to do it halfway up, and then there's another bunch of uh, what do you call horizontals up here, and again. So what I'm doing, I'm laying down a kind of skeleton of lines that I can pin all this Tudor stuff in. And that's the middle. And then that's the middle. And, and that's there. So it's giving me a structure to work on. And then I'm going to divide it up into chunks and put a door in. Yeah, uh, and pull out the door, and then the window, and then there's a big bit, and then there's a door, and then another window. So I'm hoping I can get the nice wiggly bits to match those lines. So putting a structure in like this is very useful um, to get your windows and doors right, but we've got the extra. <clears throat> challenge of the extra tutory bits. Hmm. So one of the first ones I'm going to do is the middle one, and I'm going to be very clunky. I'm going to use a big pen, and I'm not going to worry about the door lintels. Did I say that was the middle one? I did, didn't I? Uh, middle one. There we go. 
And then there's this one here, but that's got windows in the way, which is very annoying with it. So I think I'm just going to do this really easy. I think, I think, I think. I'm going to call that a window. I'm going to call that a window. And then I can start thinking about putting some verticals in here so I can figure out what I'm doing. So we'll call that a window, that's a window, and that's a window. Sort of, except I brought them down too far. <clears throat> Never mind. Okay, and then the bottom of the windows are actually a bit higher. Another thing, another thing, another thing. So these are the little windows. And then we got all that fancy Tudory stuff. Uh, <clears throat> oh, and there's something going on here. And there's something going on there. I run out of space, but never mind. Okay, everybody okay? Okay, are you okay? Okay. I'm going to put the doors in. <clears throat> okay, doors. I was trying to draw these lintels earlier and they're really annoying, but, but I suppose they would correspond to, again, where's the other door? In between the windows, so it must be here. So this little gable over the door, the bottom of the, I mean the top of the door will correspond to that managing point. So let's put the doors in. All that door. And oh dear. It's probably as you think, oh that's nice and simple. But sometimes, when you really look at it, not so much. Okay. Not madly. Okay. And then, uh, I suppose we better put the other windows in. And then there's a line, a tutory bit. Uh, so this is a window. And this is a window. This is when I realized that it was bloody complicated. And then the bottom of those windows again would correspond to that vanishing point. And then there's a window over here, which must be in this bit here. And again, corresponding to that vanishing point. And then we have the other tutory bits. Uh, and then this line, the center line here. Again, corresponds to that vanishing point, but in fact, it's the horizon line. <clears throat> That's not quite right, but never mind. You know, we can have lots of time with our tutor beams. Yeah. And then we got a big old cross here. And then that goes there. So these are all uh, vertical lines, which are easy. <laughs> and it goes there. And then we got here. And here. And something happening here. Yeah. That's not bad considering. This is how terrible I thought it was. And then we have a couple of windows up here, which are quite small, but again, they, their tops and bottoms correspond to that vanishing point. And if I make a little window here, And 
in that random point. Okay. <clears throat> Is everybody okay? I'm not going to take this any further. If you're working on a rough one, that's perfectly fine. This is a rough one. Um, uh, and now I'm going to do some painting. I think we need to get away from all this maths and think about painting. But I just wanted you to be able to draw a building that reads right. Uh, one thing about pitch roofs, these will be parallel. This well, depends on the building, really. This is a bit lumpy. But that line and that line will be parallel, even though the roof itself diminishes because of the vanishing point. So anything horizontal on this plane corresponds to that vanishing point. Uh, but you've got a pitch roof here that's all diff difficult and different. Um, but anything on this plane, will correspond to this vanishing point. Okay. How are we all doing? Because I'm going to cheat now. Aha, just because I can. And I thought, I couldn't do a good demonstration of the vanishing points on my watercolor, my beautiful watercolor, which I'm just about to paint. So I've drawn it up and what I've done, this is actually a uh, cold press paper, just a bit about equipment. Um, no, it's hot press paper, which I don't particularly like, so I'm going to use this pad up. But what it is, it's a watercolor glue pad. Um, can you see, so here, it's all glued all around the edge, so it's kind of stretched already, so you don't have to stretch paper. I kind of like them, um, but uh, this is, well, I can go on about paper makes, why not, we've got a few minutes. This is a German make, um, and you can see here, um, no, it's in German, uh, <clears throat> it's uh, 300 grams, 140 pounds, that's the weight of the paper, and uh, that is the minimum you want for watercolour paper, but it's okay because it's on a stretch pad. Um, it's also hot pressed. So you have various types of watercolour paper. Hot pressed means they've squashed it with a hot press and it's very smooth. Uh, I think I must have bought this in error. But why not use it up? Um, so you also get not. So you get watercolour paper that says not, and that means not hot pressed, which is very unhelpful. Uh, and then you can also get one called Rough. And my absolute favorite paper in the entire universe is Fabriano Rough. I get a bit excited when I start touching it. Uh, it's very rough and it's so forgiving. There are all sorts of different kinds of paper. I don't tend to like this make very much. It seems to have too much size on it so the paint doesn't kind of move around on the paper as much as I'd like. Um, I'm trying to think, Hockingford's fine, but um, if you like your watercolors, uh, if you can invest in one of these, there you go. Uh, a glued pad, so it's called a glued pad block, I think. Mold made watercolor block. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so I've drawn this up. You can see I've done it actually in a blue crayon. Uh, just so that I'm hoping it will all disappear on me. And what I'm going to do first is in fact, just draw lines. I realize I've done it in water soluble pencil, so they'll disappear. So this is my own problem. I'm going to use a, a waterproof felt tip. Is it in my pocket? No, it's not. Okay, <clears throat> what is oh, I've got my <laughs> I just want to put these black lines in first. 
So with this one, because it's a Tudory building, I wouldn't use the water soluble pen because it will end up a terrible mess. So here, I want to use my water proof pen. Hang on, I'm just pinning these up again. Right. <clears throat> uh, so I've got a point 0.8 and I just want to get all the black bits pinned down so I know where I am. And then I'm going to go on and actually uh, use watercolor. Say, okay, we're going to do some painting with paint. So I'm just going to go in here and I'm going to do it freehand because if you use a ruler, all your lines become a bit dead. So I'm just pretty much going over my outline and then I'm going to color it in. Uh, oh, it's got a wonky roof. What's happening to that pin? Uh, so I'm going to put in the wonky roof. Wonky, wonky, wonky. And then it's got all sorts of tiles and bits. Things come through here. There, I said those lines should be parallel, and they're not parallel. Never mind. And then here we've got these tiles. So I'm just kind of making marks just to indicate the texture of the thing I'm dealing with. And again, a bit of a chimney. Yeah. Yeah. And that roof goes there, doesn't it? And put a chimney pot on it. And then over here, but nothing wrong with Wonka. We all saw Ptolemy D. He likes Wonky. But if you just keep your perspective lines right, it doesn't matter how wonky you are, it's still going to look like a building. And then again here, so that's that bit. And then I'm just looking at various details. I think there's a drain pipe here, there's some sort of uni pattern. So I just want to put in my back. That's one drop. Uh, my horizontals and verticals. And I did have a lot of problem with this side when I was drawing this up. I think I've got it sort of right. Uh, I'll put in that. And we can't really see what's going on there, but then it's got this kind of barn shaped roof. We're just going to pretend we can see it. And then. What I'm going to do sneakily is actually transfer to a bigger black pen and I'm just going to put in my two blue beans. Oh dear, this is going to take ages. Uh, there's some two blue beans. It's quite nice, but it is going to take ages. Uh, so I'm just going to crack on with this pen and I can boost them up later. Oops, I just smashed it. Never mind, it could be cross thickness. Ah. And then within here is this little window. So what I'm going to do is actually use a pencil uh, just to put in my two halves of the window. And what you can do, uh, one, two, three, one, two, three. So if you put in a little uh, guide <clears throat> for the window panes, just as lines, and then when you come in with a pen, you can actually just use those pencil lines as guides for a bigger blockier thing, as it were. So this, again, you're giving yourself structure in the uh, to put in your window panes, rather than thinking you just do these squares, getting them to marry up, it's gonna be hard anyway. So again, letting go, oh dear, that went wrong. Uh, <clears throat> window up here, I hope that those lines are right. I'm not convinced they are, but let's do it anyway. And again, I can just put in these pencil lines 
and draw around my window panes. Ugh. If I were to meet her. Oh, how about Tony Dean? Yeah, that's wrong. Never mind. <clears throat> and again here. So this pretty much like that. So I just put a line for uh I don't know what you call them, things that hold window glass in my window panes. And I hope my guidelines are reading right. So I've got the window panes there. Ah. And then if you were feeling brave and clever and you wanted to do this mainly in pen and ink, you could put a bit of the texture in of the tiles, but I don't know if I would recommend doing that. You could just do a few, trying to keep to your kind of perspective lines with the vanishing point being over here. And just having a bit of, a bit of texture, which you could go crazy and draw them all, but I don't think we have time. And again, I suppose the most important things in here is to kind of pin down the windows and doors. I might actually edit out that little over the door, the little uh, whatever it is, uh, porch, arch, something, because it's too difficult. Oh, I don't know, I suppose I could. I want to put the doors in because they're kind of the main features of uh, the house. Uh, and then I've got a window up here. Yeah. But the bottom and the top of the window will correspond to your vanishing points. Uh, window there. And I've already put in my little marks for the window panes. I'm just going to draw around them. Yeah. And then we have another And this goes down. Like that. Um, there's my little window. And then I have a window here, which is underneath that window, so that's something. In this black square, which is bigger. Edit it down to three window panes across. And then actually that comes in. And that comes in a bit. And then we have one here, here, and here, and here. Oh, it's going to take a long time. Right. <clears throat> now we've got our door. In there, and then we can start putting some decorative bushes in. Let's have some bush. So I'm just going to sort of indicate bushes, just with kind of squiggly lines, so you know where you want to stop drawing. Oh, there's all sorts of things happening over here. Yeah. And then we've got this kind of wall coming around. Oh, I've got a gate. I've just noticed that, which would be a nice feature to have, but I don't think we can fit it in. Um, and then I'm just going to block these in the windows just so I know where they are. Oops. Okay, windows and the other door. So again, I'm sort of putting my horizontals in so I know where everything is. Um, and then, uh, here we are. So I'm going to go to the central line like I did on this one. So I'm doing the central line. I'm hoping that corresponds to the right vanishing point. Hmm. 
And then we have this line here. I suppose I'm going to put it in so I can get the news bits right. And then there's a line here. Now I'm just going to look at the pattern of uh, the two dreamers of it all. Uh, so I'm actually going to perhaps do the outlines of these Tudor beams, and I'll go back and fill them in later. But I just wanted to show you big washes before we, uh, rather than spend all my time coloring in black lines for you. Hmm. But yes, lean back from your work and have a look. That's all right, I suppose. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just outlining it and hoping to colour it in later. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Down. Mm -hmm. That's therapeutic. It sort of becomes mental knitting. Uh, I think pen and ink can really do that because you have to do a lot of drawing rather than painting. You can actually uh, cover a large area quite quickly. Yeah. Tall and skinny, then a piece of window. And then, oh, look, they're nice and lumpy. And then here, lumpy. And we've got quite a big dark area here. So I kind of like uh, pen and ink and wash. Uh, it is, does become sort of like colouring in, which I'm now going to think about starting. And I'm going to refer also to that uh, picture I sent through with Liam Farrell. So I'm actually going to leave some white space around here, I think. But over here, we've got someone else's garden. Mm, what's that doing? Oh, it's being covered by bushes. And then, oh, what's going on? And we've got this nice texture of a wall. Which for flint, and goodness knows we have enough flint around here, you can't just wiggle around, really. I'm just wiggling around. Give it a little bit of texture. And then <clears throat> we've got someone's garden. And then another bit of a brick wall. I think I might leave that actually, make that white space. <clears throat> so we're going to do something called a vignette when you don't paint the whole thing. Which is all good. It's got a bit of a wonk on it, hasn't it? Oh, I'll wonk that a bit. I'm just leaning back to see if it reads right, more or less. So I'm just going to take a little break. Okay. And I've got a couple of other slightly small brushes, probably a size four. <clears throat> and my Van Gogh watercolours. These are uh, the bigger set of the Van Goghs, 24, which is very good. Big fan of these now. I've just got a spare little palette for mixing. <clears throat> so in an ideal world, I'd rub out all this stuff, but I think this paper is so odd. It's actually been, I'm not used to this kind of paper, it's actually being affected by the rubber. So I'm going to hope that the, um, the uh, watercolour crayon I drew with 
will actually dis dissolve into it. So first things first, I'm going to put on big washes. And if you look, uh, so it's sunshine, I'm a great believer in sunshine uh, when you're drawing uh, or painting or anything very much, uh, because you get, uh, I don't know, more dynamism, more color to deal with. So it's sort of on a gray day, like today, everything looks a bit dull. Uh, but this, although you know this is white, it's actually not white. So that's white, and that is kind of a balloony white, isn't it? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a big wash on here of uh, trying to match that color. And I'm going to put that shadow in there, but I'm going to leave the white to be white. I'm not going to do the sky because I'm going to do that vignette thing, like uh, that Liam O'Farrell uh, painting I sent you. So first things first, I'm going to get me a big brush and it's not too big a surface, so I'm not going to wet the whole surface. And I'm going to probably get some French ultramarine, uh, which is this color, it's kind of colder of blues. It's almost violet, you see, so that's got kind of blue tinge that you kind of perceive in there and a little bit of Payne's gray which is this color. So a combination of those two, I'm just going to go over most of this with that. Except I'm now seeing a little warm creaminess to it. So I'm going to have a bit of yellow ochre knocking around as well. And that's yellow ochre. It's that kind of mustard color. Yes, okay, let's do this. Okay, so that I'm going to have a, a wash. I'm going to make a wash. So I'm going to make a good puddle of yellow ochre. And it's always useful to have test paper lying around so you can figure out what color you've got. So that's quite pale, but actually I do want it pale. And then I'm going to make a wash of French ultramarine. So here, and again, quite a good puddle of French ultramarine. There we go, French ultramarine, and then a reasonable puddle of Payne's grey. In front is this bit. So again, that's that sort of grey colour. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll just have to refuel. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, Paints gray. Mm. And again, I want to test that color. A bit more. So I'm just going to add a little bit more water to it. And in fact, and so get your big brush. The first thing I'm going to do is use my medium sized brush and mix up some of the French ultramarine and Paints gray. And just put in this shadow here. Something brush. Okay, so I'm just going to go straight across and put in that shadow. And look, you're getting the feeling of sunshine already. Okay, yes, I'm going to be brave. I'm going to leave it that dark because when you're painting on white, it's quite hard to judge sometimes the tones, how the tones are going to react with, when you're painting more and more colors on your piece of paper. Often the color you think is quite dark when you first apply it, when you applied everything else, um, it's, it's not that dark and you have to go over it. So on this bit here, I'm going to go over the whole thing. And again, I've got a mixture of Payne's gray and French ultramarine. And I'm gonna put a tiny, tiny bit of yellow ochre in there. This is a little bit of a glow going on. And I'm gonna paint over this whole thing, bravely, with a big brush. So I'm just going over here, trying to keep the paint moving and keeping it wet all over the place. This is why you use a really big brush because you want everything to uh, not dry. So everything here is still wet. Hooray, hooray. Ew, not a bit dark. 
Do I have the courage of your convictions? I'm just gonna. Now I want to paint now. I'm just gonna put some yellow ochre in there. I'm gonna start on fiddling. Make sure there's a bit of a glow going on. <sighs> oh. <clears throat> And having just said all that, I have this terrible urge to uh, lock some of it off, but I'm, I will have my courage and my convictions. I just don't have those in here. Something like Bob Ross. All right. And I might just lift, oh, there we go. And what you can do, so I'm just lifting some of the wash off with a clean, dry brush. So I've got my brush, I've dried it. And then I can just lift it off. And you can only do this when, when your paint is wet. As soon as it dries, it becomes a bit, uh, you start getting streaks and things. Because everybody knows how unforgiving watercolours are, which they certainly are. So you have to have a light touch and always rely on a lot of the work you do being on wet paint. When it's wet, you can do all sorts of exciting things. But when it's dry, not so much. Right. Hmm. And then I'm going to paint this bit here because I think that's probably dry. And I want to get that nice sunny terracotta colour. So I'm going to use burnt sienna. Oh. That burnt sienna. Uh, which is the colour of ter terracotta. Uh, it's a bit transparent sometimes. So sometimes you have to really get it going. And I'm just going to mix up a good puddle of it because I know it's going to run out of me. So we want a good puddle of paint. Oh, hello, cat. A good puddle of paint. I don't think that's enough, so I'm going to mix up some more. And in fact, what I'm going to do is also mix up some more yellow ochre. Uh, so I can drop that into that wash because it's not a unit because these are handmade and this is why it's so charming. Um, it's all the handmade old thing that it is. Um, <clears throat> it's not a uniform colour. So again, I'm going to use my biggest brush. I'm going to pick up that wash. Look, it's all disappeared. So let's hope it works. Uh, oh, I want to go around the windows. I don't want to paint them. Oops, terracotta, which I just had. So a big brush with a good point, you should be able to cover this area quite quickly and in one fell swoop. I want to leave my windows. And then I'm going to, oh, I can't resist it. I always like to do this with watercolors. So I've actually dropped something else in while it's still wet. I'm just going to pick up a little bit more burnt sienna and drop that in, in some places. You see, so I'm getting a nice wet in wet effect going on there. Get some texture. Yeah. Then I'm just going to pick up some yellow ochre. I just want to pop some yellow. Whoa. Because I'm painting vertically and this is rather wet. Oh, I rather like it actually. Um, I'm getting some weird and wonderful shapes appearing, but let's have the courage of my convictions. So I'm just trying to vary the colour a little bit. So I've got some darker areas of burnt sienna and then <clears throat> some bits of yellow ochre, which hopefully I could do something about later. Okay. Of blotch I want to get rid of. So ah, when things are wet, you can often just get rid of them like that. Look, gone. Oh, I think that's dry. I don't see like it's a terracotta cup. <clears throat> okay. So then I'm going to do the roof, which is a slightly different colour. So I'm going to have a whole bunch of burnt sienna mixed up. Lots and lots and lots. And then some burnt umber. So there's my burnt sienna puddle. 
not a bottle. Um, and then I'm going to have some burnt umber, which is a warm brown, a little bit darker than uh, the burnt sienna. And again, a big puddle of that. But I'm just working up the paint. And this is burnt umber. Oops, I can't really see it. Can you see it's a slightly different color and a darker brown. And then I also want some Payne's Gray. Mopping around because it's quite cool. Ooh, it's got lichen all over it. And yes, when, once you start looking, you start seeing. And then a little bit more yellow I think. So I can drop it in when the <clears throat> urge comes upon me. So I'm going to start, I think, by doing the roof. Ooh, that's not enough. As I say, you want a big puddle. This, these little well palettes are quite good for watercolors. Um, so you want almost half full, I would say, of a wash that again, you're going to use. Because it's always disappearing on you and then while you're mixing up new paint, the watercolor you applied has dried on your paper and it's really annoying. <clears throat> so I'm just going to take my burnt umber. And this is quite feeble, so I'm just going to add a bit more color to it. And hopefully you can cover the whole area with umber. And I'm getting some nice effects going on there. And then I want it a little bit lighter for this area. This is where your kitchen kind of comes in useful. Um, so over here, a little bit lighter. Put an umber, and then I'm going to go in with a tiny bit of Payne's Gray. Um, just to add some texture. Maybe the edge of the roof. And a bit there. Just to have a bit of variation. And as I'm painting vertically, I would not normally do this with watercolor. I'm getting these rather nice streaks. And I'm just going to have a little bit of yellow ochre. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> that wasn't what I was expecting. <clears throat> However, let's have a little bit more. And I can feel brave because I know my paint's still wet. I'm having a bit of a fiddle, but as you know, watercolors don't fiddle. Hmm. Well, that's different, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, I suppose while we're here, we could do those chimneys, but I'm going to use burnt sienna for that. So that's the terracotta one, this one here. And I'm just going to, with a medium sized brush, and it's a bit feeble. Let's get some. Um, a bit more pigment in there. Uh, I'm just going to paint this. I'm going to paint the whole thing, actually. And then add the shadows a little bit. And then again here. And this is pretty much like covering in, which I'm not doing a terribly good job. But uh, with watercolors, you get this unexpected thing happening. And the trick is to kind of embrace it, really, because I really like the streaking that's going on there. But I'm only getting that because I'm painting vertically. Mm. <clears throat> OK. Well, as this is all wet now, what I'm going to do is actually uh, paint my bushes. And as I said, I wanted to do it in the style of that artist. Uh, so to not have to cover the whole paper. So we're going to have some decorative bushes in various shades of green. Um, <clears throat> uh, as, and then leaving white space. So I'm going to leave probably white space there. I'm not going to do the sky. Uh, I might put that building in though. Because hmm. oh, so the bush puts it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this building has also got this uh, vanishing point problem, but um, 
you can see the sort of tiles or the bricks uh, in the flint work are doing that, and that's got a very extreme vanishing point. But there's one going on there too, so I'm not going to put that in. Uh, and then just add the decorative needs of the door. Um, but okay, let's do our green. So in this nice set, I've got something called sap green, which is always a good starting point for doing greens. Which it may take a while to get them going there. So I'm going to have some sap green mixed up, which is that very nice bright green. But you have to excuse me for a while while I mix up the paint. So that is a good basis generally for greeniness, the sap green. But then again, uh, we've got this dark green, this viridian color, or phthalo green, they're very similar, which is that mad blue color. And you say, whoa, my bloody egg. <laughs> that is a mad blue color. And I want some of that mixed up because I'm going to add some burnt umber to that to calm it down a bit. Hmm. Oh, is that sepia? Mm. So, umber. okay, so that was that before I added burnt umber, and this is the combination of the two. And you can see it's much more normal now. So that is a good thing for your shadows of your bushes. But with all this lovely uh, sunlit foliage, there's a lot of yellow in there. And if I was using my proper paints, I'd probably use something called green gold, but I'm just going to have some yellow knocking around in my palette. Yellow, yellow, yellow. In fact, it's come out green. Uh, because I didn't have a clean brush, my green is now yellow and my yellow is now green. So that's actually pretty good. So if I was going to paint uh, this foliage here in the front garden, I would probably use a bigger brush. Okay. Sorry, I'm just getting some more yellow going on. That's what I want. Uh, maybe a little tiny bit of sun cream. No. No, <laughs> no that all went horribly wrong. So I'm just going to get some more yellow going on. So I'm using both yellows. I've got a lemon yellow and a cadmium yellow, I think, here. Lemon yellow is too cool and cadmium uh, generally works quite well. So I've got this yellow. So what I'm going to do first is paint the sunny bits, this lovely bright yellow. And I'll take it all over. So with watercolors, I hope everybody can remember, you always paint sort of dark to light. No, light to dark, so dark to light is always. So I'm just creating this vignette, I hope. Yeah, with the yellow. And then also here as well, back to the yellows. I want to get that nice, bright, sunshiny yellow. You can see uh, <coughs> in the summertime. There's some over here too. And then I'm going to go into the green. So mainly sap green, I think, just to keep it bright and sunshiny here. So actually, these are all blending because they're wet, which I always like. And I'm just going to leave that off there. And again, some sap green over here. I'm just going to switch to a smaller brush so I can get more pigment knocking around. And there we go. Here. And over here. You can wait for these to dry in between, which is often quite a good idea. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so you, you get crisper lines, but can you see, so I've got that nice bright yellow, and now I'm working in um, some slightly darker green in the sap green. And then over here, <clears throat> this is all in shadow. So what I want is that dark green I mixed up. So that's the viridian and the burnt umber. I'll go in there. Oh, it's all going to get madly. 
And can you see, so you're getting that nice sort of three tones of greens that you can deal with. So. I'm just having to mix up some more because I didn't mix them up. And in fact, I've got this nice weird drip going on here, which I kind of like. <clears throat> so, oh, look. <clears throat> and I might leave it. And then over here, kind of a bush in front of the house, which again is dark green. So by getting the darks right, you get the lights right. So to have this nice darkness here will make that seem lighter. And try to create some sort of bush, I suppose. I'm going to leave that because I like it. And then over here as well. So I want some of that dark green in here to give this foliage some form. And I'm just randomly really adding a bit of dark, with some foliage kind of stuff. Actually, that worked really well. Damn. Get some more that going on. <clears throat> so obviously, I've got to wait for those bits to dry. And so now what I could do this building here, apart from that, that's good. I might, uh, rather drearily, I'm afraid, start painting in the beams. Oh, there's a shadow there. I could put that in. So, what I'm going to use for this shadow here is Payne's Gray. And in fact, I'm going to use my little square brush because I'm painting a little square shape. And you can see that almost brings the sunshine into the painting immediately by putting the shadow on. And then I think I need a bit more shadow over there. So it is a work in progress. So I'm just mixing my brown and my paint gray. So to get the contrast between this light and this dark, so I'm just going to go in there. And uh, this wash is now dry, so I can put another wash on top. Oh, there we go, that's getting the sunshine in it. So this is Payne's Grey and Burnt Umber, which I want to burn green. Get that contrast, although we're getting quite nice light on there. I'm getting involved in the painting now. Um, let's just soften that a little bit. I'm just going over the whole thing again, carefully, lightly, just to make it that little bit darker than that side. And I'm going to call the marks I make texture. And then I can put the shadows in here. So again, I've just got to wash a paint gray. No paint gray needed. A bit of the brown to put the shadow in here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a bit too much paint gray. Yeah, but yes, the sun comes out. I'm just going to put a little darker there. Sunshine! Mm. And then, uh, <clears throat> so I just, uh, so we painted the whole chimney, chimney colored, <clears throat> and then I've just used um, the paint spray to create shadow, the paint spray and brown to create shadow. Finding mm, up and fiddling. Right. And then, I think there's a shadow of something here, so I'm just going to put that in. Uh, I have to give it a shadow to make sense. <clears throat> and then that's going to show. Yeah. I'm having a fiddle, which feels about. But I'm just going to leave that now. But by changing the tones of these two colours, hopefully I've made it seem like it's sun now. <clears throat> and then I just want to have a quick wash here. I'm not going to do too much detail on that building, but I just sort of want it there. So I've just got a quick uh, sort of flinty colour. This is the local flint. So this is Payne's Grey and Yellow Rover. 
kind of add it when it wants to dark. So I'm just going to add some water to it and see what happens. Which yeah. is showing typical Sussex architecture where everything's built out of flint, but they put some nice brick on the front. Um, and then there's a, a building, this building is constantly shadow, but I'm going to have to wait for that bit to dry. But as I'm plowing on with plinty colours, I think I might paint this wall down here. <coughs> a bit of yellow ochre, uh, a little bit of paint spray, oh, and maybe a bit of a brown. So I'm going to burn umber. So, <clears throat> so I've got burnt umber, paint spray, yellow ochre, and uh, uh, burnt sienna. So in fact, I'm going to go over this bit first, and that is entirely too brown. Not the paint spray in there. Oh, wrong colour. But there is a warmth to flint, isn't there? There's this kind of yellowy openness to it. So I'm just going to leave that. And I'm not going to... I don't feel obliged to fill up the whole paper, which is all good. And then I want to create a little bit of texture, so I'm going to grab some yellow ochre, uh, pretty much from my box. So there's quite a lot of pigment in my brush. So I've got yellow ochre on my brush, and I'm just kind of throwing it at this wash. I don't texture. I think I've gone a bit crazy there, but never mind. I'm just And then we have uh, sort of the flint wall in sunshine. So I'm just going to use yellow ochre here, I think. And catch the top of the wall part and that, that's still wet. Yeah. Uh, I've got this great yellow drip threatening me, and great green drip. I'm just going to take that away. But here, I didn't mind uh, this being wet and that, so it kind of softens the line just there. And then I just want a little bit of texture going on there, which didn't work. So I'm just going to drop in. So this is wet wash, and I'm just dropping in some colors. This is uh, lots of fun. <laughs> so what I like to do with watercolor nowadays is do this wet and wet action. Okay, everybody all right? Okay. Now, so the way to feel, figure out if the watercolor is dry is just to feel the paper. If it's still a bit cold to the touch, it's probably still a bit damp. But as I haven't got anything else to do, I am, uh, because all the bits I want to paint are currently still wet. So I'm just going to uh, <clears throat> paint the black lines. I don't know if it's going to work. So I've got some paint spray knocking around here. And I do, do I have black? No, I don't have black. But I do have something called sepia, which I do like, if you ever come across it. Obviously, it's uh, made from squid ink. I'll just show you what sepia is like. Can you see? So it's much, so that's burnt umber, which is the one they usually give you, which is what kind of you know, gingery glow underneath it. This is sepia, which is a much cooler brown. So in fact, I'm going to mix sepia and Payne's gray. So it's not completely dead black, or dead gray. And I'm going to use my little square brush and hope uh, and paint uh, the tudory bits. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to go thicker, I think. A bit feeble. Whoa, a bit on the thick side. Yeah, and there's a little black line on there. So this is where the coloring in comes in. And, uh, and I like these square brushes because you can get you can get the square line, obviously, which I have a smaller one, but you can also get a kind of fine line as well. So square brushes are always good. Uh, I'm quite glad I didn't do it all in pen because that would have been very uh, 
I don't know, stark. So having the paint and having the paint for the wash vary a bit, I think it's quite nice. Well, I think there's another little line here. If you look, which I'm getting wrong. Never mind. Okay. So I'm just waiting for some of these areas to dry. <clears throat> I'm going to crack on doing this. So there's quite a dark area under the roof. Hmm. This is the colouring, <clears throat> the colouring in bit, which is no bad thing. And luckily, Tudor beans are all a bit wonky. So that's a plus. And then there's one big one here. Oops. With the monkey bean. Hmm. And then this is off. No, it's looking like a tuber building. <clears throat> what date it is, it looks certainly genuine. Uh, uh. Oh, damn it. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting exhausted. <laughs> I'm just going to get some fresh water. Uh, 
And then I'm going to do a little bit of fiddling. I just want to add a little bit of interest to this building here, although I'm not going to paint it all. The roof looks a bit odd, so I'm just going to give it a bit of terracotta. And I want some more fingers in there. And then there we go. Fiddling. <clears throat> well, I'll teach you to fiddle. <clears throat> right, you're all beavering away. This is all good. I was just going to do some finishing touches because this is dry now, nope. um, and I just want to get this shadow in here and maybe make this bush a bit darker. So that again, gives you more sunshine. But I actually kept this drip because I rather like it. Uh, this wet and wet action went very well. I like that and that worked well. So I'm just gonna leave those. I think I don't want to overwork anything, but let's put that shadow in. I do I'll do the shadow first. So I'm going to have a bit of Payne's grey. I want to test and see what it's like. That'll probably do. And I just want to get that shadow in there. It's just a straight line. And I don't want to depress everybody, but light also follows um, perspective rules. <laughs> um, so if you imagine you're in a sort of a grand room with wonderful Regency windows and the sun's coming in, uh, the sunlight on the floor, the pattern of sunlight on the floor will actually correspond to uh, perspective rules. So to do the windows, in an ideal world, you'd have a small square brush, which I don't think that, but I do have a small brush. I'm just gonna pick up some Payne's gray and just go in here. But windows themselves will cast shadows. So once you start looking at them, you will see how they work. So I'm just going to go in there and add the darkness there. And again, even filling in lots of boxes. I'm not going to do this one, I suppose. I'm simplifying it, I suppose, but you can see that the window lintel, something, uh, will cast shadows on the window, which actually will make them seem more uh, three-dimensional. Uh, water. So this is just Payne's gray and water, and I can just go in there and put the logos on. And then I'm going to a bit of gray so if I should just if you look at these windows there's light and shade going on so I've got a little bit of shadow there and shadow here not so much over here but uh, if you start looking at the sort of three-dimensional uh, sort of windows you will see that they're not just like uh, squares <laughs> so apart from that bush get some darkness of this bush, I would say I have finished. I'm just tootling around. I'm, so sometimes when you're sort of drawing from references or even from real life, you can get really high bound in all the detail, but I would say it's simpler. Okay. And nothing wrong with plagiarism. So <laughs> plagiarized uh, that artist, uh, just to keep it simple and you're getting this really nice effect. You get these really nice shapes. 